Hello, <coughs> and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Fareed Sadiq, President of the City Club Forum Foundation Board, and the City Club member for, I can't remember, but it's probably somewhere around 20 years at least. It's an honor to be here today to, to introduce Dr. Ahmed Rajab, the Richard T. Watson Assistant Professor of Science and Religion at the Harvard Divinity School. The professorship funded by Harvard alum Richard T. Wilson is intended to advance the research and thinking on the interrelation of science <clears throat> and religion through cross-faculty initiative. Joining us today are Richard Watson's wife, Judy, and son, David. I'm going to tell you more about Dr. Rajab in a moment, but first I want to tell you why we are, he's here, addressing the City Club of Cleveland, a venue known for more for political and civil uh, civic conversation than speeches entitled Beyond Conflict and Harmony, Religion and Science in the 21st Century. Last month, columnist Nick Christoph <coughs> sparked a, mi a minor firestorm in the academic world. He was talking about the role or the lack of a role that academics have in public dialogue. Christoph wrote, some of the smartest thinkers on problems at home and abroad and around the world are university professors, but most of them don't mass matter in today's great debates. According to Christoph, this is a fault of political leadership that has marginalized intellectual pursuit and of academics who have walled themselves off. In Northeast Ohio, however, he's, that's not the case. We have professor at Kent, uh, Cleveland State, Kent State, Case Western Reserve, and many other institutions who have routinely led their talents and expertise to public dialogue. In fact, in recent years, the City Club has played a crucial role in providing a forum for, the profess for these professors and their colleagues from across the country to engage in general pub public, notably in helping us all better understand the events, events and the Arab uprising. <coughs> That brings me to the other reason why we invited Dr. Rajab. In the post 9-11 world, it's incumbent on institutions like the City Club, beacons of free speech to lend their forum to the cause of nurturing cross-culture understanding and knowledge. The endowment contribution from the Ibn Sina Society of Cleveland that makes today's forum possible is an example of the impulse. Ibn Sina, for those who do not know, was one of the great philosophers, scientists of Islamic history. And the goal of Ibn Sina Society of Cleveland is to shine a light on the contributions of Muslims are making in science, culture, and world affairs. As a thought leader in mining the rich veins of religion and science, Dr. Rajab is certainly among, the, uh, among those making significant contributions to this in these areas. If you looked him up, it would not take you long to come to the conclusion that Dr. Rajab is a modern day Ibn Sina. His academic work on three continents spans medicine, history, science, and religion. His medical degree is from Cairo. He is, his PhD is from Paris. And his most recent teaching appointments is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. After to toiling in the mar on the margins, it's nice that he has a chance today to address an audience in the center of it all, <laughs> Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Harvard Divinity School, Richard T. Watson, Assistant Professor of Science and Religion, Ahmad Rajab. Thank you very much for this invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. And it's an honor to be in this room and uh, speaking to you today. <coughs> and uh, yes, I'm glad to be finally at the center of everything happening around the world. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's always difficult to start a talk. Probably many of you who had experience in public speaking, that's the most difficult thing. How do you start a talk? So I got you to laugh. That's a good beginning. <laughs> now the next step is how to bring you into this discussion that I want to talk about today 
which is Beyond Conflict and Harmony, Science and Religion in the 21st Century. I thought probably I could start by telling you how I became interested in questions of science and religion. When I was a medical student in Cairo, I was in one of the oldest medical schools in the region, and this medical school was built in 1827, and it is one of the biggest uh, medical schools in the entire Middle East. But I was actually, I fell in love with another hospital and another place for teaching medicine. That hospital was actually much older. It was built in 1285. The beginning of my story, the beginning of my thinking about science and religion starts with the discovery of this particular hospital that was built also in Cairo in 1285. At the time, it was one of the biggest hospitals in the entire known world. It would host hundreds of patients. It had the best physicians working in Cairo, which was at the time the biggest center for medical practice around the world, like Cleveland today. And it had some of the most important physicians working in this particular hospital. More importantly, this was not the only hospital in the region. This was just one of many other institutions that were being built around the region. There was a whole movement of building hospitals that has been happening for about a century. One of the more famous hospitals that a lot of us know about is the hospital in Jerusalem that was built in the beginning by the Hospitaller Order, the Order of St. John of the Hospital. This hospital continued to serve. It was one century older than the hospital in Cairo that I'm talking about. There was other, another hospital in Damascus and so many other hospitals in many of these important cities. I wanted to tell the story of these hospitals. There was something, a particular story that needed to be told. And this story was not a story about buildings or walls or about physicians or about medical technology, regardless of what this kind of technology is. It was mainly a story about people about patients who stayed in these hospitals, who suffered, and who actually wanted, went there because they wanted to get better. At the heart of this experience of being a patient in the hospital, whether in the one that was built in 1285, or the one built before that, or the one that I was learning in, in Cairo, in the 90s, there was something that is very much in common. Sad as it may be, this thing is some form of human suffering. A human suffering that's at the heart of our own humanity. Our suffering at the hands of disease and our desire to get better. As I was trying to write the story of these patients and to think about them and to think about their lives, one important thing came to me. The story is not a story of medicine only. It's not only a story of science. It's much bigger than this. I cannot reduce these patients into their diseases. I cannot reduce them into the symptoms and the suffering that they had. They were people. And as people, they had an entire world that is attached to them. Loved ones, traditions, religions, politics, society, all these things were manifesting in the lives of these individuals that now I was interested in telling this story. Not only interested, I felt even responsible. In a way, there is a responsibility to tell a story. Because in telling the story, we're able to give some dignity to this type of suffering. As a physician and as a historian of medicine, I started to realize that this is not only a story of medicine and not only a story of science, it's a story of science, religion, and culture. All these aspects need to be accounted for. Because although in the halls of the medical school, it's entirely what we can call secular, if you will, science and medicine, but the experiences of the patients that we deal with is different. The experience of the patients that we deal with cannot be cut, cannot be separated into different categories that should not communicate to one another. And this was the beginning for my interest in questions of science and religion. 
the interest was motivated by and caused by the idea, the realization that science and religion and culture are parts of the human experience. And what I wanted to do is precisely to study this human experience. Questions of science and religion have been studied for a very long time. Over the past 50 years, for instance, two major paradigms or two major approaches to the study of science and religion dominated our discussion. On one hand, we have the conflict paradigm, and on the other hand, we have harmony or dialogue. In the conflict paradigm, the understanding is science and religion have completely different ways of knowing the world. They are irreconcilable, they are incompatible, they cannot really work together in any way. They have been in some form of conflict throughout history, and what we see today is just a manifestation of an age-old conflict that existed between science and religion. The problem with this vision is that it's not true. Simply, historically speaking, science and religion has existed together forever. They have existed together forever. They have been together in the society forever. In fact, throughout the pre-modern period, most of the scientific institutions that were built all over the world were supported by religious institutions. Sites or religious sites were actually places where the intellectuals of the time were gathered and where they thought together and worked together in order to produce new knowledge. Religious cosmologies and understandings of the world were part of the making of scientific cosmologies part of the making of treatments, of technologies, of things that people used again and again in their daily lives, things that we call today technology. Not only that, it goes the other way too. Science was extremely important in the making of our religious understanding. Because as we change the way we look at our world, as we change the way we understand, say, the relationship between Earth and the Sun, we change our own religious cosmologies. Because science is not something that's separate, that's out there, that we study in a room and then we close it. Science lives with us. Science is the reason why when we look at the sun today and we actually observe the sun moving, we know it's not moving. We know that we are moving. It's because of science. It's because science forms part of our own cosmology, of our own perception and understanding of the world. And this perception and this understanding of the world is part of how we think about our own religion. Because religion is not only words that are written in books. Religions, religion is a lived reality. And because it is a lived reality, it is part and parcel of this conversation. A conversation about how we understand the world around us. The conflict paradigm is simply unable to prove itself at the historical level. It doesn't survive any test of history. But could it survive today? Can we say, for instance, that the conflict paradigm describes pretty well the relationship between science and religion today? Yes and no. Yes, if you Google science and religion and you watch particular clips, yes, you'll, feel, you'll see a lot of conflicts there. No, in the lives of a lot of people, including a lot of the people in this room and outside. Because again, for us, our lives cannot be cut into pieces. Our dealing with technology and with science, with medicine, with therapeutics, is part of how we understand the world, and our dealing with religion is part of how we understand the world. The problem is the problems that we face on a daily basis are made of both science and religion and of our culture as well. The other paradigm of dealing with science and religion is the harmony paradigm. Thinking that the way we can understand science and religion is to have people talk to one another. So for instance, let's consider why particular or how particular theories in physics are compatible with certain religious views about the universe. Or how particular methods of healing are compatible with new medical ideas. Or how, for instance, theological views are compatible with the discoveries of modern science and so on. This view is obviously more complex than the conflict paradigm. But it, the problem with this view is that it fails to see the real problems that we're facing. 
This view is based on the idea that we just should sit together and talk about our theories and our ideas. But this is not the way to solve actual problems. This is not really the way to understand how the world works. We may be interested in how particular theories work together, in how particular theoretical perceptions of the world work together, but the social scientist should not be only interested in things in the books. The social scientist should also be interested in the human condition, in how people live their lives. For me, the new direction that we should have for science and religion is to move beyond studying only books and things that are written about theories in science and theologies and rituals and religion and think about how they actually do live together in our society. Let's not try to prove that they can live together because they do in all of us. Let's move beyond this point and think about something else. Think about the problems that we face in our daily lives. Let's think about end-of-life care, a problem that people face all the time. Let's think about health care. Let's think about the environment. Let's think about real issues that influence people all the time and try to see how the discussion of science and religion can be useful and important in solving these significant problems. In order to do that, we have to understand science and we have to understand religion in a different way. Science cannot be just theories that we read about in books. We have to understand science as an actual practice that we live in, that we understand and that we own. Science is not only produced behind closed doors or in laboratories with men, mostly men, wearing white coats. No, it should be produced by everyone. And it is part of our lives, and we have to understand it in this way. Religion is not, also, is not something that is only written in books and that is also kept behind closed doors. Religion is a lived experience. It's a way, the way a lot of people experience their life on a daily basis. And in order for us to answer real questions about our world, we have to really understand how religion and how science function in the society, not only in books. How people understand their science, how people deal with their technology, and how people understand religion, and how people deal with their religion. The story is the story of people, because that's really what matters at the bottom line. It's the human condition, our understanding of ourselves. Not only that, but today, we are living really in a different world. And that's why part of the title of my talk is Science and Religion in the 21st Century. We are living in a world that's far more connected than any other time in human history. We are connected through media. We are connected through open skies. We are connected through a lot through the internet, through so many means that allow for our societies to be connected. And this connectivity that we're living in, this age of connectivity, makes our society in general pluralistic and global. There is really, we have now to question the difference between the local and the global. Our local problems have global implications, and the global conditions and the global problems have very significant, clear, and important local implications. Our world is more pluralistic, not only because of the number of people that we personally know, or because of the people who live in a particular town or in a particular city, but because our world is connected. Because we are able now to listen to people from different backgrounds and from different parts around the world, we are living in a way, in a unified world, that is far more connected, as I said, than it was ever, than it ever was throughout human history. However, as connected as it may be, it is equally divided. It is divided by a lot of chronic problems that we keep suffering from and that become more and more serious with time by virtue of our connected world. It is divided by poverty, 
it is divided by illness, it is threatened by, threatened by important environmental problems, it is divided by forms of discrimination against women, against minorities, it is divided by all these things that do not now exist in some faraway place, they exist in this connected global world. It is connected because the open seas and skies, the, f the distance doesn't matter anymore. But it is divided because we could be living in different worlds when we're living across the street from one another. It is this unique nature of our world today, a global environment that is threatened and divided by a lot of problems that adds more urgency to the action that I here propose and that we in the program Science, Religion and Culture at Harvard are trying to tackle. The idea that because of this world, because of these new challenges that we're facing, we have to move beyond simple theoretical discussion, discussions about who's right and who's wrong. The idea that we can say, can science answer the big questions or not? Can religion answer these questions or not? Can they live together or not? All these questions can be excellent questions. However, it seems there is more urgency now it seems there are much more at stake that we need to think about. Which means that in order for us to design solutions for the problems that we're facing today, we have to first learn and understand. And in order to understand, we need to understand ourselves and we need to understand, as I mentioned, the human condition. And to understand the human condition, we cannot say, I will only study science, or I will only study religion, or I will only study culture. We have to have a more holistic view. We have to be able to learn more about ourselves and to learn more about the world that we are living in. And this kind of learning, this new knowledge that will allow us eventually to understand the sources of these problems and to come with solutions, to come up with important solutions and significant solutions for these problems, this is the challenge that we need to think about. The question of science and religion, I would argue, is no longer a question of conflict. Any student of history would definitely know that this notion of conflict is a very modern construct. It started very recently, and it started for very clear cultural, sociopolitical reasons. We can talk about this longer if you want, but the main issue here is the entire paradigm of conflict is based on very peculiar historical circumstances. Not only that, it is also based on neglecting and ignoring the fact that science and religion do interact in our daily lives. The paradigm of harmony that dominated the discussions of science and religion for a very long time is a very interesting attempt at trying to understand the relation between the two. At least it moves beyond the question of conflict. However, if our discussion is always limited in this area of trying to make them talk to one another, we're also neglecting the human condition. We're neglecting the fact that science and religion do talk to one another, do live with one another in the lives of the very people that we're trying to study. What I'm trying to propose here is to move beyond conflict and harmony. Take the idea that science and religion live together for granted. And why do I take it for granted? Because I see it around me everywhere. Because the people, because the condition that we see around us is the makeup of scientific and religious and cultural views. What I also see is that there are scientific, religious, and cultural reasons for many of the problems that we deal with. There are economic, social, and political reasons for all the problems that we see. And we need to address these reasons. And we need to be able to understand how science and religion function in the society with the people so that we can devise new techniques and new ways to address our different problems. My talk here today is not intending to say that the work of people on science and religion is bad or wrong. 
I think it's extremely important. And I am, as many other people working in science and religion, are indebted to all these people who had ideas about how to create a dialogue between science and religion. My point is, in this new world, we have to have a different sense of urgency. And my point is that the social scientist in this new world, that the programs of science and religion, like the one we have at Harvard, has to move beyond these discussions and to start to address the actual problems. To go back a full circle to these patients that I wanted to tell their story in the hospital built in 1285 in Cairo, their lives were made up of all these things. Their lives were made up by the techniques and the knowledge of their physicians that they sought so that they could find some treatment and cure for their suffering. But their lives were also made up by their spiritual advisors, by their religious leaders, by their communities, by their loved ones, by the people that they trust. And that these people should be able to help them make a decision. And when I look today, at many of the patients that we see, for, some, for many of them, the spiritual advisor is there, not because they know a lot about medicine, but because they know a lot about the person. Because after all, the disease is a condition of the person, not of an organ. It's a disease, if you will, a condition that affects the whole person. And if we are to solve problems that affect whole people, we have to be able to think about ourselves and our world as a whole. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to Friday Forum fe featuring Dr. Ahmed Rajab. Richard T. Watson, uh, Assistant Professor of Science and Religion at the Harvard Divinity School. We will return to our speaker momentarily for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We encourage you to formulate questions from our speaker now and remind you that your question should be brief and to the point. We, we welcome all of you here and those joining us through our primary media partners, 90.3 WCPN, and 104.9 WCLV and WVIZ PBS idea stream or any of the any one of the many other radio stations across the country that carry City Club program. Television broadcast of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by University of Akron. Today we welcome guests at the table hosted by Baker, Hostetler, and Teaching Cleveland. Thank you all for your support. Today's program is inaugural Ibn Sina Society Forum at the City Club of Cleveland, made possible by generous don gift from the Ibn Sina Society. We thank you for your support. We welcome students to today's program. Students' participation is made possible from a, from a generous gift from the Pipeline Development Company joining us today are students from Streetsboro High School. Will the students please stand up and be recognized? <laughs> Thank you for your support. Next Thursday, March 13th, the City Club welcomes Martin Blank, President of Institute of Educational Leadership and Coalition for Community Schools in conversation with Eric Gordon, P.G. Stintfield and Bill Kitson, moderated by Pete Van Leer. For more information about, about our upcoming forum, please, and, and to make a reservation or to order a CD or DVD of today's program, please refer to our website, www.cityclub.org. Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club questions and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone including guest holding the microphone today is development associate Mike Kermaldi. Please, the first question, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk today. You. Um, when you talk about when this, this conflict is recent, my opinion is a big part of this conflict is communism and fascism 
which clearly wants to eliminate religion from the world, and killed hundreds of million people in the process, and uh, grabbed uh, Darwin's theories to advance communism and fascism, which is a murderous ideology. So my question to you is, truth still has to be questioned. There are numerous scientists that still doubt Darwin's theories. It's not fact. What's your opinion about Darwinism? What's your opinion about communism? <laughs> so, I think as a physician and as a scientist, I have to say that the the consensus of scientists today that the best explanation of our world is the modern evolutionary theory. And I, I don't say Darwinism because Darwinism is not a scientific theory. The, the modern evolutionary theory is, um, is the discussion of evolution. It's a, it's a complicated theory of evolution. And it's, um, you know, it's far more complex than just quote unquote the survival of the fittest. There is a lot of discussion about that and there has been a lot of research about that and I think I would say that the consensus, the scientific consensus today, uh, which I subscribe to, is that the correct explanation of the existence of diverse species in our world today is through modern evolutionary theory. Um, now, to say that the, the notion of conflict between science and religion was propagated by fascism and communism, I think would be a little bit of an oversimplification. Um, I think uh, the story is much more, um, is much deeper than this. Um, and not all the people who speak about the conflict between science and religion are fascists or communists. So it's really, it's a much bigger story than just questions of uh, fascism and communism. Welcome, Professor, to Cleveland. Thank you. Um, so your theory regarding uh, conflict and harmony and science and religion, I'm just wondering what insights you might have on the, take Al-Qaeda, for example. Um, they're using very sophisticated, scientifically inspired um, mechanisms of war, and yet their religion is, many would think, are kind of archaic. So w what's the connection there, and what insight do you have about the connection in science and religion in that situation? Right. So that's a very good question. When I suggested, when we study something, that doesn't mean that that thing would always be good. So that's actually part of studying. Studying means that we understand things. So it means that it could, there could be bad things, there could be good things. But the only way you can actually understand them is through studying them. So my idea was, or my, the, the idea that I'm presenting here, is that we should study questions of science and religion in the lived reality because they are in the lives of people. Now, the, um, the notion that there are particular, for instance, Al-Qaeda had this kind of archaic ideology that's also connected to certain scientific uh, production, I would say that it's connected more to certain technological products and that it is not really connected to specific scientific worldviews. So the scientific worldviews or the sciences that they hold as part of their worldview is pretty much consistent with their archaic ideologies. But it's the technology that's different. And these are really, I mean, they sometimes war work together, they sometimes walk hand in hand, but not necessarily. There are a lot of people who, are, who deny basic scientific theories and still use their iPhone. So, you know, <laughs> it's just, it doesn't really, they, they, they are not, uh, it's not one or the other. Um, people have been always able to use the cutting edge technology without necessarily buying into the scientific theories that these technologies were built on. And we can obviously sort of mark or underline the hypocrisy that's part of this, but hypocrisy exists, so. About uh, 2001, Professor Bernard Lewis of Princeton published a book called What Went Wrong? And he is describing the decline and fall, essentially, of the <coughs> Uh, Arab world as a center of science and literature and so forth. And one of the theses he has uh, is that the religious leaders controlled the curriculum of education and had the effect of throttling innovation and invention. 
would you comment? Yeah, so <laughs> great question. So I, well, I mean, Professor Lewis is obviously a very well-respected historian. However, I would completely disagree with his arguments here. <laughs> um, so I think, and it's not only me, I think a lot of other historians of science have seen clearly that um, the basis of this argument is built on what we can say very old information, that new discoveries and new studies prove that they were not true. So the notion that, um, that essentially scientific production ended in the Islamic world around the 13th century because of the control of religious scholars over the uh, scientific institutions is simply false. One of the reasons is, for instance, the hospital that I was describing that was built in the end of the 13th century and thrived throughout the 14th and 15th century. Other examples include a lot of observatories, astronomy, theories in mathematics that were produced in the 14th and 15th century. Not only that, but even advances in, um, in uh, for instance, navigation and in uh, um, sea travel that happened under the Ottomans at the same time that the Spaniards and Portuguese were developing new ways of discovering the quote unquote new world. Now, so the question remains, what went wrong? That's a very complex question. In part because nothing really in history goes wrong. Things lead to particular trajectories. And in many ways, we have to understand history in this kind of complexity. So let me give you an example. One of the things that people keep talking about when they say what went wrong is that the Spaniards, while the Spaniards were trying to cross the Atlantic, to get to the Americas, the Ottomans did not make any attempt at discovering new routes or discovering new worlds. And while the Portuguese were trying to circle around Africa to get to Asia, the Ottomans again didn't attempt to do anything. And this is, for many people, a sign of things went wrong. However, let's not think about it being wise after the event. Let's try to go there and think in their, own, in their feet. For the Ottomans at the time, if you have a short and clear route that takes you from Europe to India through the Red Sea, why would you go around Africa? <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make economic sense. As a matter of fact, we have proofs now that the idea of going around Africa, of fighting the Portuguese or fighting the Spaniards, were presented in the Ottoman courts but then were rejected, not by religious scholars, but by people who had simple economic capacities, who said it's way too expensive and absolutely useless. <laughs> now, the Spaniards happened to hit the America on their way for in to India, and that, well, went well for them. <laughs> but, but the idea is, the bottom line is, we cannot judge history based on what happened ultimately. Because people don't make decisions like this. In our daily lives, we don't make decisions based on how will this look like 100 years from now. We make decisions based on the best information that we have at the time. And that's what kept happening. Now, in many cases, the decisions that you make based on the best information that you have at the time would be a failure. Because the information is not accurate or not complete or other things change during you know, the interim period. That's perfectly fine. That's how history works. So the idea is what we see throughout human history, particularly in the period of quote unquote decline, when the Ottomans are supposed to be closed off Europe and there's no contact with Europe and the decline of sciences, we see functioning societies where the people living there didn't think of themselves that they were in decline. They were simply having a very, a very clear economic model that worked for them, which is instead of producing completely new things, let's try to perfect a lot of the things that we have. So for instance, they were not, there were no longer physicians who are producing new types of operations, but there were way, way more physicians, which means that the average person was actually living better. Now, when you look at it, after the event, it looks different. But as a historian, you have to look at things as they happened then, not as they look today. And for that reason, what went wrong, I would say, history. <laughs> what, what went wrong with the British? What went wrong with the French? 
We can keep asking these questions again over and over and over again. But the answer, there's really no answer for these questions because history is about change. Things do change. And there is no reason why one particular empire or one particular group of people would control history in general. My, the bottom line is, and again, this is an excellent question, is that this story, the story of the Middle East or the Islamic civilization, is really a story of a particular region that had sort of heyday, wonderful times, like a lot of other regions around the world did throughout history. And then this is just how history functions. There are times where you have wonderful prosperity, and then there are other times when you don't have that. So, and again, finally, the story of the Ottoman Empire, for instance, has to be understood as well in conjunction with the story of the Spanish and Portuguese empires. They all rose to the top at the same time. The Ottomans became a world empire in 1517, which is at the same time that the Spaniards were discovering the new world, the quote unquote new world and the uh, Portuguese were discovering the route around Africa. And by the 19th century, when the Ottomans essentially fell and all, lost all their territories to the French and the British, the Spaniards and the Portuguese were losing all their territories to, this, to the French and the British. So my point is, it's a world story. It's a story that involves so many actors, so many regions, and so many changes across time. Thank you. Uh, we talked about uh, the need to go beyond conflict and uh, harmony right. as a new trend for the 21st century. For uh, so that science and uh, religion would uh, coexist, if I may say. But it seems to me that it's, a, it's an older idea started by uh, Ibn Rushd, like Averroes, already 13th century, when he stated that uh, there are two truths the secular truth and the religious truth. And that was actually the origin of the uh, science explosion in, uh, uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. After I've been practicing like auto da fe for any scientific uh, idea that did not, was not supported by the sacred text. Could, if you could please uh, elaborate on Ibn Rushd a little bit. And it seems to me that's what, that's what we are here. Like this right. is not a new idea. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, first of all, as, a, as I just corrected some information about sort of the state of the Islamic world during the period, I think the information that we normally have about Europe is also a little bit faulty. So again, historians of science, the, the idea that there were a time in Europe that's called the Dark Ages, where essentially scientists were being persecuted, that is not accurate historically either. It is the same period where you had new schools of medicine new places, new innovations, and new scientists. And believe me, the people living in the Dark Ages, they didn't see it as dark. <laughs> they saw it as a new, you know, the time where people are living. So again, let's, let's try to move away from issuing judgments about previous historical times. That's the first point. My point now is about the fact that we are facing new challenges that were not there before. Now, naturally, the basic idea behind a lot of the things that we do today can be found in previous iterations throughout history. But if we are only to reproduce old ideas, we will never be able to address the new challenges that we face in our world. So what I'm trying to propose is definitely, is it completely new? No. I would have loved to say yes, but no. There have been a lot of great thinkers before me who said very similar things to what I'm saying. But what I'm trying to do in the program that we have is to put these ideas in action in this changing reality that we have. And to use this or to think about the world in a different way, how this world is really different from the, you know, the world that we used to live in only 10 years ago, really and how this difference and this connectivity of this world should be tackled in a way. Yes. Um, I listened to your comments, and I th thought of myself being in your class, sitting and taking notes. And when it was over, I would look at the notes, I'd scratch my head and said, what is he saying? And I'd go on to the next class. Can you give me an example of where science and religion today are compatible 
and an example where science and religion today are not compatible. So I would have mentioned examples, but I only had 30 minutes. Normally, classes run for an hour, so <laughs> I would have had more time. Now, yes, there are obviously, I can, I can give a number of important examples. So I can give you examples of what of the things that we actually do as application of the view that I'm suggesting. So for instance, we're studying, we have a new project that's starting in South India, where we're studying how religious institutions can help distribute health knowledge and ideas and awareness of public health and how this can actually benefit the population and, ben and help us in eradicating problems like alcoholism and obesity in the villages that we're studying. So that's one of the things that we're looking at. We're also, we have a, another project that addresses environmental theology, which is thinking about the theological ideas in different traditions that discuss questions of the environment and nature and the protection of nature and the environment. Next year, we're going to have a big conference on questions related to death and end of care, uh, end of life care. How can we understand end of life care in a different way? How can we understand death in a different way? Death in many ways and for many people throughout history wasn't always such a terrible experience. In many cases, it was just a natural ending of a particular life. How can we tap into this information to allow people to deal with this period of the, at the end of their lives in a different manner? So that's another thing that we're trying to do, working with scientists and scholars, working with religious scholars at the same time. One of our associates is also working in a stem cell research lab, and we're considering questions of ethics related to stem cell research. We have other work with our with colleagues in the law school and with a lot of people who work on questions of legal, uh, the laws controlling health care. And we're thinking about religious communities, their views of health care, ethics in health care, and how we can talk together about these issues from health, uh, from the perspective of medicine and health care cost, but also from legal and ethical perspectives. So th these are examples of the things, the new things that we are doing. We, I obviously can give you examples about the things, about the uh, scholarship of people um, that people keep bringing up in question of conflict, like for instance, the trial of Galileo as a, the famous example of how science and religion are in conflict, which is obviously true. I mean, it did happen. However, the issue is when you look at the grand scheme of things, when you look at history on the long term, you'll see that this particular trial was really an exception. And in the history of the Catholic Church, for instance, in Europe, the Catholic Church and its different sites were really the places for education of different sorts of things. So there are exceptions that are, you know, comings and goings throughout history, but we need to look at history very carefully. History cannot be evaluated in the short term, and definitely it cannot be evaluated with sort of wisdom after the event. So I would have said that if we had a full class, but this is just 30 minutes. I just want to go a little bit short-term history here. I'm thinking 22 years ago, um, when then presidential candidate Pat Buchanan articulated a culture war in this country, and we've seen that played out over the last 22 years. And, the candidates we elect, the funding, the, bu the federal budgets uh, for research, uh, scientific research, health research. And I, I just wanted to get your more short-term historical take on the culture wars in this country as they were articulated and how, how do we go forward from this point in history to the next few years? Th this, is, this is really an excellent question. So when you think about the culture wars in this country but also in different other parts of the world, we have to think about two main issues. First, there are obviously conflicts that do exist. So my discussion was not attempting to say that there are absolutely no conflicts. There are. But that these conflicts need to be studied and studied carefully, not simply just dismissed, simply because we need to understand them and understand how these conflicts are happening if we are to solve any problem. The other, and I think even more important issue, is that a lot of these things that we call cultural wars are not only about culture and are not only about religion and science, really. A lot of scholars who did a, a very interesting work, anthropologists, for instance, around different parts of the world, see that what we, or told us, 
that what we look at and consider religious objections to something is usually a stand-in for a lot of other things. That people sometimes use religion and say, I object to this because of my religion, because they think when they say so, they will get a better, they will get more respect, that you will listen to them more. But there are other things. There are other things that are related to access, that are related to communities, that are related to relations between different communities. We have to not only take these statements at face value, but we have to understand them carefully. Now, yes, someone would come and say there is the quote unquote cultural wars, which are portrayed as simply wars between cultures, as in ideas. But these ideas are rooted in people, and these people live their lives. So why are these people who are living these particular lives are acting in this way? Why do they not, for instance, see certain benefits or certain problems with particular approaches? My call here, this talk, is, is not presenting a solution to the problems, but it is a call for us to think more deeply about things. And this is really, this resonates with what you mentioned in the beginning about the call for scholars to become part of the public debate and public life. And that one of the roles of scholars and people in universities in dealing with public issues is to help us, to help everyone understand. Take some time to understand things in details because when we understand, we'll be able to deal, to actually form things, form solutions or create solutions to the problems as opposed to just acting in a sort of a knee-jerk uh, process. So my comment on the question of cultural wars is that I don't like this concept because I think it summarizes a lot of much more complex things. And I think for us to understand the real problems and attempt to solve them, we have to actually look deeper and deeper into why these things are happening, into cultural, religious, scientific, but also social and political reasons for all these particular questions and conflicts. As you talk about beginning to wonder about some of these things in your medical practice, and for a while I served as a chaplain in a pediatric hospital where my parish was the int pediatric intensive care unit, the level one trauma team in Hemonk. As you're speaking about the coexistence of culture and science and religion, I'm shaking my head and saying, absolutely, it's so clear. But for someone who hasn't had that experience, that immediacy with the topic, what's the best way for do you, do you think for people to, to really embrace this idea, is there a shortcut? Is there an experience? Do we all need to go to Harvard Divinity? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the basic thing, this is, this is really a, a great question. Um, I think the basic issue is that we should focus on the problem that we're trying to solve. So working as, as a physician practicing there, I, I've seen a lot of conflicts that happen in the teams, for instance, between chaplains and physicians and so on. And these conflicts normally happen just because every practitioner of these practitioners focus on what they do rather than why they are doing it. And that's really the key issue. The only reason why we are in, say, a hospital setting is that we want to help these patients. That's the bottom line. So if we all focus on this, that we are actually, you know, we are trying to help these patients. And so let each and every one of us do their best to their best knowledge in order to produce results that can actually improve in the immediate term, improve the work condition. Now, I literally mean that people should stop the, each other and say, let's remember what we're doing. Because sometimes we get caught up in you know, doing a lot of things and you know, pickering with one another. We need to stop and think, what are we doing here? We're trying to help patients. So I can help the patient in this way, and you can help the patient in that way, and that's why we're working together. Then you're doing great thing. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question that involves the convergence of science and religion. I expect my great-grandchildren to be born in a few years, and they've recently discovered still more stars that, or still more planets that 
are, could be producing life while they are circling other stars in the universe. So there is a reasonable feasibility that your, grandchild, your great grandchildren could have some sort of communication with these beings. Now with the modern theory of evolution, uh, do you think that those beings with whom they communicate will look like us? <laughs> Well, of course, that's a question I cannot answer because, because of the modern theory of evolution. So it's, evolution is the result of a particular thing of the environment around us. And naturally, when we meet these people, you'll find someone other than me, naturally, who would be there, you know, analyze the environment there, and we can produce, you know, a new idea. The thing is, just sort of, the bottom line is, the theory of evolution is a way of explaining a reality that we have. Now, will it be different sometime if we start to know new things? Of course, any scientist believes that you change your ideas and your theories based on the findings that you have. So at this moment, and that's what I said in the beginning, at this moment, the agreement of the scientific community is that the best explanation of what we have around us, the one that has most evidence supporting it, is the modern theory of evolution on earth i have to say so <laughs> outside earth i can't say yeah thank you today at the city club we have been listening to forum friday forum featuring ahmed rajab uh, Richard T. Watson, Assistant Professor of Science and Religion at the Harvard Divinity School. Thank you, Mr. Rajab. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This program is now adjourned.